Good evening, everyone. Thanks ever so much for joining us for this session on Sydney Sussex, making a competitive application. So we're going to talk to you this afternoon and evening about a few things that we hope will be relevant to you. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, choosing your post-16 subjects and making sure that you are on the right track with things like that. And then also showing a little bit about how those subject choices feed into the university application decisions you might want to make. Um, we've got quite a packed session for you. So I'll give you a quick sense of how it's going to work. Um, and then I'll get our panel to introduce themselves uh, one by one. So I'm Catherine, I'm the admissions director here at Sydney. And that means that I'm responsible for managing the admissions process, making sure that it all runs smoothly, but also helping our directors of studies make the admissions decisions. Um, I'm an academic in geography um, and I teach in the geography department as well. But today I have my admissions hat on and I'm going to talk to you for about 40 minutes um, about the kinds of things that might be relevant to you. More excitingly, we have uh, our student panel here um, and there is an opportunity at the end of this session, um, also of about 40 minutes, for you to ask any questions that you might have. And you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there is a handy Q&A box for you to type those questions. Please feel free to ask any questions that you have. Um, we will get to them uh, through the Q&A session. session. Um, we will pose them to the relevant student member um, and we'll hopefully give you a little bit of clarity and plenty of enthusiasm for wherever you are in your application journey. So I've introduced myself, I'll ask our students to introduce themselves too, and then we'll kick off with the presentation, which I will keep mercifully brief, I promise. So Maria, would you like to go first? Right, hello, um, so I'm Maria and I am a second year uh, doing archaeology here at Sydney. Anna? Hi, my name's Anna. Um, I'm also just at the end of my second year and I studied natural sciences and I specialise in chemistry. Katie? Hi everyone, um, I've just finished my first year um, and I uh, have studied classics, so uh, the language and culture of ancient Greece and Rome. Brilliant, thank you. And Elizabeth? Hi, um, I'm Elizabeth and I've just finished my first year and I'm studying engineering. Brilliant. Thank you all so much. Um, so as you can see, we've got lots of subjects represented and a fantastic student panel for you to ask your questions of. Um, so I should say that this session is being recorded. That does not mean that you as um, attendees are being recorded. Your Q&A questions are not being recorded. And obviously we can't see you and we can't hear you either. So it's just us with our faces on the screen being recorded. And we'll send you a link to this recording um, for your future reference. Right, let me see if I can work out how to share my screen. This presentation is going to run you through very quickly two main things. So we're going to start off by talking a little bit about the kind of pre-work that you might do to making a competitive application. So choosing appropriate subjects for your post-16 subject choices, because I'm aware that we have a mix of both a year 11 and year 12 people in the audience. So I'm going to talk a little bit about subject choices. If you're a year 12 person and you, you listen to this advice and you suddenly get a, a deep sense of panic associated with your A-level subject choices, please don't feel that. Chances are that you've made the right kinds of decisions. And if you want any kind of guidance and reassurance at this stage, don't hesitate to put something in the Q&A box and, and we'll get to it and chat about it. But hopefully this will reassure you in the decisions that you've already made. And if you're, these decisions are ahead of you now, they'll give you a little bit of insight into the kinds of things we're looking for and how they feed into the admissions process. So your A-level choices can have quite an impact on the subsequent university decisions that you make. And I want to stress immediately that that's not just a Cambridge specific thing. So if you're thinking of making applications to selective universities, whether that's in the UK or elsewhere in the world, the kinds of course choices that you make post 16 can create a sense of pathway for you in terms of the courses that you would be most qualified for at university. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that is later on. 
it's worth thinking about your post-16 choices because they can restrict you in some course choices that you might make. For many of our subjects, actually, the subjects that you do at A-level are not that important. We welcome a wide range of different kinds of subject combinations. But there are some of our courses, particularly on the science and technology side of things, where actually if you make good decisions now, they'll stand you in better stead later down the line. And I, as an admissions tutor, am often looking uh, when I first look at an application particularly in certain subjects, to make sure that someone's got the most competitive kind of um, qualifications to date. And of course, part of that is looking at your academic profile, your predictions and things like that, but also making sure that you have got the kind of basis in knowledge and skills that would enable you to succeed on our particular courses. And if you're at that stage where you're thinking about what course you might want to do at university, there's plenty of information out there that we really encourage you to make use of so you can make informed decisions about your post-16 choices. So you've come today, which is a great start, but obviously the, there is more to life than Cambridge. So you can have a little look at the UCAS website. Um, and on the UCAS website, there is a collection of all possible uh, university course choices at all universities that you might apply for, together with information about their subject requirements and admissions requirements. So that's a lot of information. But if you just take a little look at some of the universities that you think you might be interested in and the course styles that you think you might be interested in, that will give you a good um, spectrum of information, the kinds of course choices that might be helpful. One example of why this makes a difference is that if you want to study a subject like medicine at, at university, many universities will require you to have studied biology and certainly one other science. Um, for us at Cambridge, we absolutely require you to have studied chemistry. That is a non-negotiable requirement for our, for our uh, medicine course. But not every university is quite so prescriptive and some universities have slightly different requirements, not just uh, for, for medicine, but for other subjects too. So do take a look and make sure that you're coming at this from a position of knowledge. However, I would say that quite a lot of courses are not particularly prescriptive about the kinds of A-level or post-16 uh, qualifications you might need to have and will welcome a breadth of different kinds of courses and different kinds of approaches. And that's largely because those skills that you gain from studying all different kinds of subjects are transferable to um, a, a higher education setting. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about exactly why that may be the case a little later on. So at this stage, you might not necessarily know um, exactly what course you're interested in studying at university. Perhaps if you're in year 12, thinking of going into year 13, you might be in a slightly more advanced position than, than, our, than our year 11s, but we'll, we'll sort of talk to both constituencies and see what happens. If you're a year 11, you might not be quite so sure yet. Um, but you might have a sense of whether you're interested in arts, humanities, social sciences courses, or whether you're interested in sciences courses. Um, and if you're interested in the arts and social sciences, then here are four subjects that we see most commonly amongst our applicant profile. And I want to stress most commonly within this. That doesn't mean that we think these subjects are best. That doesn't mean that we think they're better than any other subject you might have on offer. But what they are are tr traditional academic subjects and ones that we popularly see amongst our applicants. And why might that be the case? Well, if you take English and history, these are subjects that are preparing you to read a large volume of information, to take it in from different kinds of sources, often text-based, and then to present that information back in assessment in terms of prose, largely through writing essays or extended answers, where you have to argue a point. So they're testing your ability to um, convey your ideas successfully in writing and sometimes orally too. So English and history will be, will be sort of equipping you with those kinds of skills. Languages are, are terrific um, academic preparation for a number of different kinds of subjects, because they really do encourage you to look at structure and they look at patterns. Um, they're great for encouraging you to see the world from a different perspective um, and not just from your own kind of uh, uh, cultural context, um, but really broadening your viewpoint as well. So languages can be a really excellent preparation for a number of our courses. 
And you might be slightly surprised to see that maths is a very popular subject amongst our arts, humanities and social sciences uh, applicants too. And maths is a terrific intellectual background for a variety of things, not just because of the skills it gives you as a mathematician, not just because of the quantitative analysis that you might then go on to do, but simply because of the sort of rigorous and problem solving techniques that you might approach through maths um, and the kinds of ideas that you might acquire uh, whether that's through statistics or whether that's through mechanics or whether that's through pure maths about different kinds of theories and their applicability to sometimes real world situations and sometimes more abstract situations so again a very strong intellectual training but there are plenty of other choices too um, and hopefully this covers most ground in terms of the subject you might be doing or thinking of doing at a level so these I won't I won't go into these in any detail because they kind of elaborate the points that I've already made um, they talk about your ability to argue they talk about your ability to, to spot patterns um, and think through new contexts and they talk about your ability to problem solve as well but it's not just as restricted as that. There are other more specific and specialised subjects that you might be doing at post 16 too that might actually equip you really well for studying a particular subject at university. If you take music, for instance, if you want to read music at university, it's a really good idea to have taken a music uh, A level. It's a very good um, qualification that gives you the intellectual training and the basis in knowledge and also the, the familiarity with performance that you might then want to go on and do when you study it at a higher level. It's actually not a requirement for our music course for you to have done a music A level, but for many uh, university courses it, it is. So worth paying a little bit of attention to things like that. If by contrast, you're interested in studying a science or mathematics or engineering or technology subject at university, you'll see that your keystone subjects, so the ones that we see most commonly um, amongst our applicants are rather less um, diverse. So really my advice to you is if you're thinking of studying science at university and you want to come to a very selective university, do as much science and maths as you possibly can. Um, it will equip you for our particular courses, but also courses at very good universities too, because they will start from a high level and they will go at a fast pace and they will, they will not be wanting to teach you the basics that you haven't necessarily got already. So the more maths, the more science, the better for science and technology courses. And this is borne out by our other things that might be useful. So if you have the opportunity to take further maths, and you're thinking about doing a subject like um, physical natural sciences or physics uh, or engineering or computer science or certainly mathematics, it really is a very good idea to take further maths if you have that available to you. Um, that's very commonly what we see as a fourth A-level choice and it's uh, an excellent preparation for, for STEM courses. In some cases um, and at some universities, we do see advice to take an essay based or a contrast subject. And I know that that's the case for a number of medical schools, um, not Cambridge's medical school, but other medical schools too, do sometimes suggest that you think about something like philosophy as a, a subject alongside, or religious studies as a subject alongside your science A levels, just so you consider that, that wider ethical and actually communications perspective um, that's part of, of uh, a medical career. So there may be some courses um, that it's appropriate for you to think about these uh, less common subjects for. Um, and again, I'd say that we see these relatively less frequently amongst our applicants to Cambridge, but they're perfectly adequate preparations for some particular courses. So notably something like psychology is, is something that we very commonly see amongst our applicants to psychology, even though it's not a requirement. Actually, we want you to have done something more like biology or maths instead. So I hope that's useful. Um, to give you a little bit of an insight into uh, the kinds of choices that you either have made and, and hopefully justify um, and or if you are in the position of just making your final choices now. So how do we use this information? What happens when you, you sort of get to the point where you're thinking about making a, a university application and um, you're putting all this information into to UCAS and, and wondering how people then go on and use it once you press send on your, on your application. I want to quickly walk you through our admissions process now. And this is where I think the presentation becomes more directly relevant to our year 12 um, participants. But hopefully this kind of longer perspective will be useful to our year 11s too. Um, so 
If you're thinking of applying to Cambridge, the first and the most important decision that you will make is to choose your course. And I'll say a little bit more about that later on. Um, but there are many excellent universities in this country and around the world. There are many fantastic courses out there. Please look at the course that suits your interests. Don't assume that because Cambridge has a course, it must be the best and only way to do your subject. Um, look at the way in which other universities teach your subject and think about whether that fits your interests better, because ultimately we want people who will succeed on our courses. Um, and sometimes those courses are not the same as the kinds of courses you might see with the same subject name at another university. If you're applying to Cambridge, uh, you then have a, a next step, um, and that is to choose a college or to make an open application. Um, I want to ask our students to say a little bit more about college choice when we get to the, the Q&A session, so I won't labour the point here, but I will say that choosing a college um, uh, can be something that people stress an awful lot about, um, but actually hopefully doesn't make that much difference. More colleges are more similar than they are different. Um, and although they differ in terms of their um, overall size and location and age and potentially to a degree their, their kind of vibe, um, I've never met anyone who wasn't really happy at the college that they're a part of, even if they didn't originally apply to that college. So it's worth having a little look at, but I wouldn't spend too much time and emotional energy worrying about it. If you really can't choose, you can make what's called an open application. And then that your college will be, uh, your um, application will be randomly assigned by computer algorithm to a college. Um, and it will be treated in exactly the same way as if you'd chosen it directly. Only the admissions team in that college will even know whether it was an open application or not. And, and we're really quite busy at that time of year. We haven't got the time to worry about it. Um, you may, in some subjects, uh, be required to take an admissions assessment. Um, and please check the university website to make sure whether your uh, subject is one of those admissions assessment subjects. Um, they are divided into two camps. One of them um, is a pre-interview written assessment. And for a pre-interview written assessment, you need to register. Uh, or your school needs to register you uh, on, on your behalf. And you'll take the assessment usually um, uh, through your school. The registration deadline is the 15th of October and the assessments are taken this year on the 3rd and 4th of November. Um, so it's, it's a relatively quick turnaround um, after you've submitted your application. If you are in the other camp of subjects, there is a, 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 some of our subjects that have an at interview assessment. If you're in the at interview camp, you don't need to worry about registering. The college that you've applied to or been allocated to will be in touch with all the details and they'll probably take place um, in December, probably around the time of your interview, but not necessarily on the same day as your interview in this year. So you'll submit your UCAS application by the 15th of October, and I want to unpick the UCAS application a little bit in a moment. Um, and if you're applying to Cambridge specifically, um, you will be sent a link to what's called the Supplementary Application Questionnaire, the first of many acronyms that you will encounter within our process. But this is nothing to worry about. This is just an extra form um, that enables us to collect a little bit more information about you. We may ask you, if you're applying for an arts and humanities subject, um, to submit some written work as part of your application. And that's again, so we can have a little look at how you argue your ideas in prose, how you communicate effectively, but also we ask that that work, if, if possible, is marked by your teachers, so we can see the quality of the feedback that you're receiving on that work as well. Interviews generally take place within the first three weeks of December, and this year, in 2021, they will be online only, so there will not be interviews in person in Cambridge or anywhere in the world. Um, and the interviews are, are, are heavily talked about, and again, I'll spend some time on that a little bit later and, and invite our students to comment a bit more about on, on their interview experiences too. Um, but I hope this slide gives you some sense through its very complexity that there is an awful lot of information involved in the admissions process and the interview is just one little box um, within, within this wider picture. You'll then receive a decision on your application by the end of January. Um, and this might feel like it's quite a long window in your life. So it's about, about three months for you um, in, in through which we, we sort of uh, are looking at your application and look and assessing it and, and making our decisions. But actually it's quite a short period for us. It's quite an intensive one. And then it means that we try and look at all of this information together all of the time. 
Um, and ultimately about one in five applicants uh, are made an offer of a place. And that's actually a pretty good success ratio compared to many, many other universities that you might be looking at. So what do we use? What kinds of information do we have? What kinds of things do you put on these forms um, to tell you a little bit about what, uh, to tell us as admissions uh, tutors, to tell the directors of studies and fellows in your subject, what your interest and motivation and suitability for your courses. Well, of course, we have these A-level subject grades and combinations that we talked about earlier in this presentation. Um, and that's helpful to us because that gives us a sense of whether the academic preparation that you have is a good fit for our particular course that we're trying to teach. Um, we'll have your GCSE grades such as they are, but we recognise that you've taken um, these assessments in really quite challenging circumstances over the past uh, 16 months or so. Um, and that means that also as part of your application, we will invite you, everybody who applies, to tell us a little bit about um, the degree to which COVID has disrupted your educational uh, pathway so far. And we'll use that information um, alongside the rest of your application, just so we can fully um, get a picture of, of your academic record to date. Um, we don't have any GCSE requirements, so you do not have to have a certain number of seven or eights or nines or A's or A stars to be a competitive applicant. We take people from across that range of performance, but we will be looking at your GCSEs. Um, so they're not unimportant, they're just that we don't have a, a kind of a threshold that you have to meet. We'll also receive a reference um, from your uh, referee that you'll um, submit through UCAS. And that's helpful to us. As I've already said, we only see you for a very brief window of your life between October and January. Your school or college has known you for a bit longer than that. And so they've got a, a perspective on how you might be as a student. And so we pay attention to the kinds of things that they write. So if they say, this is the best student we've seen in 10 years, that's something that really will make us sit up and take notice. Within your personal state, within your UCAS form, you'll also submit a personal statement. And again, this is something that, that creates significant agony amongst applicants as they sort of wonder where to position semicolons or what semicolons are. Um, and it's something that, please believe us, we do read. We really do um, uh, take notice of what you write in your personal statement. But we also know that it's going to all five of your university choices. Um, so if you feel as though you... Um, need to direct uh, your UCAS personal statement to maybe a particular course that you're applying for at other universities that isn't the same as your Cambridge personal statement, that isn't the same as your Cambridge choice, um, don't worry about that because there's also an optional personal statement that you can provide on the SAQ, the supplementary questionnaire, that if you want to tell us something Cambridge specific, you, you can do so, but it is entirely optional. And we do look at your whole application in terms of its overall context. And um, we look at that context in a number of different ways. So if there have been things that have disrupted your educational um, trajectory and history so far, such as illness um, or, or uh, bereavement or any other circumstance like that, we really do urge you to tell us about it so we can take it into account. We can only take into account things that we know about. If we find out about it after your application, we can't then take it into account. So if there are things that that you need us to know about that maybe explain relative underperformance compared to your abilities, it's, it's good to let us know. Similarly, if you have a disability, please, please declare it on your application so we can then make all the necessary adjustments to assess you properly um, later on in our process. You may be required to submit written work. You may be required to uh, uh, take an admissions assessment depending on your subject and about 75 to 80 percent of our applicants those who we think um, have a realistic prospect of admission are called to interview and we throw all of this into the pot along with the material on the previous slide so we can then find out a little bit more uh, about you as an applicant so what can you do at this stage to make your application as strong as possible well work hard i mean i know it sounds a little bit trite um, but frankly, we do require very high uh, grades of our, of our students upon entry um, and working hard and consistently, even in challenging circumstances, will be good preparation for not just the kinds of um, grades that you will get uh, from your, your current qualifications, but also um, in, in kind of keeping you going through a Cambridge course, which actually does require you to work hard um, and, and be motivated to study. 
try and maximize your examination grades as much as you possibly can. Um, and hopefully you've combined that with a suitable and um, uh, competitive mix of A-level subjects. Please choose the university course that you want to do, not the one that your mate wants to do, not the one that your teacher wants you to do, but genuinely the one that you are interested in. Um, and that might be not applying to a particular university because it doesn't do the things that interest you. Um, so do your research and, and, and make sure that the course you you choose on UCAS, the courses you choose on UCAS are ones that you really, really would enjoy studying. Take the time to do some wider uh, reading and exploration of your, your subject. Um, and if you're called for interview, use some of that wider reading and exploration and do go over the kinds of material you've done in your subject so far um, to sort of enable you to, to, to make the most of that process. I just want to talk very briefly in the rest of this presentation before I pass over to our students about the criteria that we use um, uh, in a bit more detail and exactly what we do with your personal statement, with your teacher's reference and, and with interviews. I'm not going to talk in this presentation about um, how we assess your academic achievement, how we use admissions assessments and how we use written work, um, just because uh, I think certainly for the latter two, they're not necessarily applicable to everybody. So I'm going to focus on the three that, that really are. Um, references. Now, I know it can be hard to write a reference. I write lots of references too. Um, and it's potentially useful to know that almost all of the references we receive are glowing, um, really extremely positive about you as individuals. Um, and, 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 and honestly, a pleasure to read. Um, so the kinds of things that we find helpful in a reference um, are clear indicators about how strong a student is within their cohort um, and over time. Um, and this enables us to, to sort of create that sense of academic context. We already hold information um, about, about the school that you're at um, and its, it's um, academic history and its record of sending students to university. So we can set this alongside some of that information too. So we really do take notice if your teacher is willing to say about you, top of the class, or one of the best I've ever talked. That's a really useful um, validation of you as a student. Um, and it's great information for us as we're thinking about how you might make that transition to studying with us. It's great to have comments from subject specialists. Um, often references are composed of comments from your individual subject teachers. Um, and especially where that is, uh, where that emphasizes the most relevant subjects that you are studying, um, that can give us real insight into your skills. And the reference is also a useful place where we can start to see some contextual information. So we can see it in terms of that kind of cohort specific analysis of you, um, but it can also be a place where your school can tell us a little bit about things that maybe didn't go to plan. So maybe your GCSEs weren't quite um, what you wanted them to be. And there may be a very good reason for that. So your school can take that opportunity to, to use the reference and explain that to us. And equally, they can showcase where things have really gone extremely well, particularly if you're, yeah, you're then on an upward trajectory in the studies that you're uh, doing at the moment. Personal statements uh, is the, the second thing that I want to, to focus on. Um, and I know that we offer uh, separate workshops on, on how to write a personal statement, so I'm not going to go into masses of detail now. Um, do uh, try and attend those personal statement online workshops if you possibly can. But I think my, my key message is that they are personal. They are yours. Um, there is no blueprint for writing a personal statement. There's no kind of magic formula that you have to follow. Um, so that means that you can look at two personal statements and they can be very, very different in terms of what the student has done, how they have pulled the information together um, and how they've tried to create this, this, this overall piece. Um, so please do own your personal statement, make it about you because it's really your opportunity to tell us something about why you're a good fit for this course that you really, really want to do. Um, so, so see it in that vein. Um, it can be a starting point for interview discussion, particularly in the arts, humanities and social sciences. We quite like to, to take things that you've written in your personal statement and, and give you an opportunity to explore them a bit further. 
So we might take something that you've read or something that you watched or a podcast that you've listened to or something like that. And, and if particularly if you've written about how much you enjoyed it or what, what you found challenging about it in your personal statement, your interviewers might well latch onto that and, and, and get you to talk about it. So, so do make sure that um, anything you write in your personal statement has actually been achieved by the time you, you come to interview. There is nothing worse than asking you about a book and finding out that you only got to page two. It's, a, it's, 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 not, it's not a great start to, to an interview discussion. Um, we're kind of looking for the quality of your reflections on the things that you have done rather than the quantity of things that you have done. We don't weigh personal statements. We don't say you've done 30 things and you've done three things and 30 is better than three. We really want you to tell us about what you got out of doing the things that you can do. And those things can be many and varied. Um, because I'm getting on in years, I kind of immediately touch base with reading as the first thing that you can you can do to support your application. But the list is endless. You can look in, you can watch stuff on YouTube, you can do a MOOC, you can um, go to lectures, you can do all, you can go to historical sites, you can do work experience, you can do any number of different kinds of things um, that enable you to reflect on your subject. And we have no particular things that are better or worse than any others. So it's about the reflections you have on those things that you have done, not, not how many of them you've done. Do try and focus on the course that you've applied to. Um, it's, it's not a sort of test of you as a, a, an overall being. Um, it really is a, a, a focused, almost letter of application um, that says, OK, I'm choosing this course. This is why I'm a good fit for this course. So try and keep that question central in your mind when you're thinking about what you can include, because you've not got a lot of space on your UCAS form. Um, so keep it, keep it tight. Um, the odd spelling mistake and, you know, uh, typo isn't going to cause us a deep amount of, of, of existential angst. You know, things go wrong in personal statements. We know that you've probably read it 20 times and, and you can't necessarily um, see things when you've read them that much. So, so don't worry if you submit it and then spot a typo. That's not, that's not going to count against you in any way. But do take care of your personal statement because it will go to other universities too and they may not have the chance to meet and interview you. So they may be looking at your personal statement uh, in, a, in a slightly different way. Um, and uh, certainly in my subject, we get, we get quite a lot of, um, as I stood on the banks of X waterfall, I realized I have always been a geographer kind of um, uh, sentences and personal statements. And they're, you know, they're lovely, um, but I kind of want a little bit more from that. I kind of want to know about your academic engagement with the subject. And part of, your journey, part of that is your journey to the subject. Part of that is your enthusiasm for it. But OK, you like a waterfall. That's brilliant. Now what? What have you done that tells me about your interest in waterfalls? Where did you go next? What did you think about it? What was problematic about it? What was exciting about it? Do something with the kinds of things you write in your personal statement. So personal statements over and done with. I realise that I'm doing this as a kind of whistle stop tour, but we'll, we'll keep going. Why do we interview? Um, this is probably the most heavily mythologized and heavily discussed part of the Cambridge application process. And we know that it worries people. Um, and no matter how many times we say it is one part of a wider interview process, it is always the thing that people worry about most um, and kind of uh, want most reassurance and advice on. And we're happy to provide that. So please do look at the interview workshops that we record and put on YouTube. Um, for, for specific advice on, on interview questions and how to prepare. We interview because we're very fortunate to have an exceptionally well-qualified field that can look quite similar on paper. Um, so that can have an outstanding academic record to date, a fabulous set of predictions, a really cogent personal statement, a glowing reference. If they've taken an admissions assessment, they've likely done very well in it. Um, and so we have to, to find extra information from around all of this to, to enable us to differentiate between candidates. And this gives us not a final data point, but one extra data point to sort of put into that, that, that pattern. It gives us an opportunity when we meet you to look at whether your interest and aptitude is suitable for the course that you've applied to. So, so whether you have got this kind of good fit between applicant and, and course. 
we will be asking you challenging questions at interview. Um, it's not necessarily something that you will find straightforward, although we hope you'll find it enjoyable. Um, it will be, we'll be testing you. We'll maybe asking you things that you don't know the answer to. Um, and we'll, we might be asking you to work things out that you perhaps haven't thought about before. And we'll do that in a variety of different ways, depending on your subject. Um, and we're doing that to try and assess this potential you have to study your subject at a high level. And also look at these, these skills of thinking and learning um, and um, applying new information in, in new contexts uh, to, to what, you, what the kind of question we asked you. So for instance, we might give you something unseen at interview, perhaps a picture, perhaps a graph, perhaps a text to read, something like that. And we don't expect you to have seen that before. In fact, we probably hope you haven't ever seen it before because we want you to see we want to see how you apply the stuff that you do know, because you do know an awful lot and you're very good at, at the subjects that you do. Um, how do you take all of that and how do you apply it to something that you haven't seen before? How do you sort of use those skills that you have? Where it's appropriate, and it's only really appropriate in two of our courses, and they are medicine and veterinary medicine, um, we look at your vocational commitment to your subject. Um, and that's quite important in a subject like medicine. Um, if you're thinking of going off and, and, and working as a healthcare professional after, uh, after graduating, um, it's a challenge. It's a challenge in a number of different ways. And although you don't have to go on and, and become a doctor after, after doing a medical degree, the majority of our students do, and it does, it does lead to a clinical phase of, of, of a degree. So we do need to make sure that you, uh, you've thought about what that might be like as well. So the kinds of things that you might see in an interview are varied, um, but what they're all trying to do is get you closer to the subject that you are applying for um, and ask you questions that are relevant to that subject to see how you think about that subject, often in a new or slightly unfamiliar context. So we might talk about your personal statement, um, we might talk about the kinds of interests you have in that, we might sort of build on some of the things that we can see you've done in your A-levels, maybe because as one part of our application will ask you to tell us a little bit about exactly what topics you're doing at school. That's in the supplementary application questionnaire. So we might sort of try and build on the kinds of things you tell us there. In a, in a sciences interview or a maths or an engineering interview, um, uh, you might well be getting out a pen and paper uh, and working through actual problems. Um, so it's a very good idea to get used to talking through your work and how you think about those problems now. And in the arts and humanities and social sciences, we might give you a text uh, to discuss. Maybe that's before the interview that you have time to read and might form the basis for some of our discussions. So again, that's something that you can kind of practice for and get into the habit of doing so speaking aloud your thoughts. Um, Interviews are, are interesting and engaging experiences. We really want them to be positive. We know that you're likely to feel a little bit nervous um, and we take that into account uh, when we're interviewing you. And actually, do you know what? We're probably quite nervous too because we want to, we want to ask you the questions that give you the best chance to shine. Um, we're not trying to trip you up. We're not trying to um, um, be difficult or, or anything like that. We want to have an enjoyable, challenging conversation with you. And that, that will mean uh, uh, asking you things that maybe you don't know the answer to. Um, but we know you don't know the answer, and we're interested in how you then work through from that, from that position. Um, so don't worry about the interview. See it as part of a wider process um, and know that we're very good at contextualising it within everything else within your application. So I want to start um, bringing this presentation to a close and moving on to the, the exciting uh, element of this, which is not me talking, but which is other people talking. Um, so as you're thinking about making your application, no matter where you are, whether you're at the end of year 11 or whether you're at the end of year 12, um, there are things that you can do over the next few weeks and months um, to make sure that application is as competitive as, as it possibly can be. Choose your course wisely, really do. It is the single most important decision that you will make. Um, there is so much information out there. Uh, choose one that fits your interests um, and what you care about, because you will be much happier studying it if you actually like it. Try and do well in the subjects that you're doing and qualifications that you're doing at the moment. I'm sure you'd do that anyway, um, but do that 
because it's valuable in and of itself, not just as a, a reason to get to university. Um, and do that because it, it, it uh, equips you well for the kinds of study you will do uh, when you get to a, a higher level. Um, take the time uh, and space while you have it to really enjoy and explore the subject that you love. Um, it's, there's such freedom at this point to, to really find out what you care about, discover it. There's so many resources to enable you to do that. There's no expectation on our part that you take a particular pathway or have a certain love. Um, it's as individual as you are. So take the opportunity to, to explore your subject and really enjoy that process because it's, it's a joy in and of itself. Um, and it also stands you in good stead in our application process too, whether that's in writing your personal statement or completing an admissions assessment or answering questions at interview. And practice. Practice talking about your academic interests. You probably don't do this as a matter of course now, but, but try and get into the habit of doing it because um, it's, it's a good, uh, it's sort of slightly analogous to what an interview might look like. It's certainly analogous to what a supervision might look like. Um, and it's, it's a good way of getting you to sort of feel more confident and um, secure in the ideas that you have. And indeed in having ideas and owning the fact that you have opinions and, and good points to say. Use where they're appropriate, um, uh, past uh, admissions assessments um, and specifications. There's loads of stuff available on the university webpage, all for free, please don't pay for anything. Um, and, and make the most of that information that, that we provide for you. There's also lots of stuff on, on preparing for interviews, both on Sydney's YouTube channel and on the university web pages. Um, and have a little think about uh, time management as you go through this, um, not just uh, in terms of you know, how you do a test and how you do an interview, but also in terms of um, you as individuals. We'd like you to have a work-life balance. Um, we'd like you to be happy uh, and, and um, contented when you come to university and to be really able to make the most of that experience. Um, and so don't feel as though this is the be all and end all. Keep the things that you love in your life as well um, and, and come into it with, with enthusiasm, um, but also with a, a sense of perspective if you possibly can too. So I'm gonna stop talking now. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, and I'm now going to um, uh, take a bit of a breath <laughs> and move on to talking about our, uh, our Q&A um, session and questions. Um, we've got quite a few questions that have come in so far, so thank you so much for the people who have um, submitted uh, questions so far. Um, we've got a few admissions uh, questions that I will um, come to as, as we go through, but there are also things that I want to uh, bring in our uh, student uh, volunteers on too. Um, so I'm just reading over those quest the questions that you submitted to make sure that they are that, that we approach them into in the right kind of order. Um, and I want to ask our panelists to say a little bit first about personal statements and the kinds of things they wrote about in their personal statements um, and how they kind of got, got those ideas about what to put in and maybe also what to put, what to leave out. Um, so who will I go to first? Do I want to volunteer to talk first? Yeah, Katie, thanks so much. Um, yeah, so hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for that talk, Catherine. It was really good. Um, yeah, so for my personal statement, I, having heard all that advice, didn't follow a lot of it. So first off to know that just because you don't do one thing in kind of the correct way, that's okay. Like I'm still here. Um, so I, I kind of, went for a more list-like approach because I wanted to show that I'd done a lot of things and to be fair if you have done a lot of things that's really good to talk about but um I definitely agree that looking back I made it a lot harder for myself because when you include a lot of things in a personal statement that means you want to know them all well because they could be discussed at interview and so I spent a lot of time going oh no I've put sort of seven books in now I've got to know all seven books and have opinions about every bit of them. And I found that quite stressful. Um, the bits that I did really like that I put in were um, 
things that I really enjoyed, particular topics. So I really enjoy Greek theatre. Um, so I put in some plays that I'd seen, things that I'd got involved with, and then how that linked to my studies. Um, and then also Sappho, I found really interesting, this Greek poet, um, and she kind of writes about sexuality. And so I drew, drew that into kind of interests I had. Um, so it's all about linking it and making sure it is something that's personal to you. I struggle quite a lot um, because I had teachers kind of saying, I don't think you should include this or this makes you sound too much of a certain way. And I was really scared when I said, no, I think that I should keep this in there. But I wanted it to stay true to kind of me. So that's one thing I will say is it's really good to show it to other people and, you know, to have people give feedback. But I would limit how many people you show it to because you want to make sure that at the end of the day, you're still handing in something that is personal and is something that you think reflects you and your interests. So, yeah. Sorry, basic Zoom error. That's terrific. Thank you so much, Katie. Cheers. Some really good advice there. Anyone else want to weigh in on the topic of personal statements? Yeah, Maria. Yeah, um, I think I completely agree with Katie when I say that, you know, it's nice to sort of have an idea of what you should and shouldn't you put in, but, you know, not to the extent that you've written something and it's going to completely change what you've written, because in the end of the day, you just wanted to, treat, to stay true to yourself, not only to your experience and what you've done, but also your personal style of like talking, because we've all got a style of in written word, and it's really important for it to come through. Um, I think in my personal statement, I talked a little bit about the work experience I did. Um, so I worked in two excavations and I did archaeology for context um, and I just talked a little bit about what I learned and how it just made me love my subject even more and just how it brought out like more interests um, in me than what I had before I did them and I just talked a little bit about um, how that interest in my subject came so I come from Greece and sort of Greece archaeology was kind of like a natural thing um, when I was young there's this stuff everywhere here so it just came very very naturally that I just got this interest and this curiosity to discover them um, and this is that something I also talked about in my interview. And it's just nice if you do know how that interest came about. Um, oftentimes, um, you can discuss it later on with the interviewers as well, and they can see how much you actually like the subject. So yeah, that was what I did. That's lovely, thank you. If Anna or Elizabeth, yeah, Anna, do you want to go into Yeah, that? sure. Um, <laughs> I think some good advice I once received was, um, if you already know what course you're applying to, you can look at the t different modules in your course. So for natural sciences, there aren't maybe as much modules, but you can look at the guide to the course and find different lecture courses. And then through that, you could get an idea of which one of those maybe sound interesting to you. And if you can find anything on the topic and like if you're struggling to find maybe something more in depth on, about the topic a good place to start might be a podcast or a youtube video or a ted talk or something like that um to get you sort of into the into the field a little bit and um so yeah i think that's how i found a lot of the stuff i ended up doing and reading and looking into also i remember reading a couple of personal statements um on the student room even though i had an incredibly stressful time looking at the student room like generally um i wouldn't necessarily recommend looking at the forums but the personal statement section is actually very helpful um and they have per university per subject they have uh, personal statements so i remember reading quite a couple of those and sometimes if they mention a book i'd you know give a, a google see um whether that seemed interesting to me um, so yeah, that's kind of how I got started. And I remember when I started writing, the first draft was like absolutely the hardest part. I think once you've got something down, it's it's way easier to to edit and stuff. But don't don't worry if you feel overwhelmed when you first start writing. And also, um, don't worry about starting with your with your introduction. I think normally the, like body paragraphs or maybe the extracurricular paragraph or something like that are way easier to like sort of get in on and then you can always get back to the rest later when you're maybe feeling a bit more inspired and in the flow of things so yeah that that would be my advice yeah I, I just want to jump in there really quickly I remember like googling how to start a personal statement and all I found were like things you shouldn't do and it was like <laughs> don't start with a quote don't start with an anecdote don't start with I've always been interested and I was like look I'm going to be honest I have no idea what I can start with now um and so you might like see rules like that out there. I, I did start with an anecdote and it worked out. So like, don't worry too much. But yeah, like Anna said, you know, sometimes the beginning is a really hard place to start. So bullet pointing stuff you've done, stuff you find interesting and writing some of the body can help you, you know, get more confident to then go back to the beginning. 
And also don't worry too much about making a mistake because I remember in my cousin's statement, I read this book and I criticised it quite heavily, I think. Like I wrote in a couple of reasons why I didn't like this book very much. And then afterwards, when I like went to read F about it a bit more before my interview, I realised the writer was um, a Nobel Prize winner in chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> so I like immediately regretted my decision there, but I think all worked out fine. And I th I'm sure my director of studies must have had a good time, like a good laugh reading that. Um, so yeah. You've got some brilliant advice here. This is really good. And, and Katie's point is a really good one. I mean, I realise I've given you a few rules in the presentation to break them. It's it, they're, they're, they're not there for, to, to fence you in. They're there to sort of help if you need, to, if you need some help. Um, Elizabeth, I'm sorry we left you till, till last there because you may not have anything else that you want to add, but feel free if you do want to add something. <laughs> I just say um, write your first draft over the summer so that when you go back to school in September, October time, yeah, September, um, you already have your first draft because the start of year 13 is quite stressful because you're trying to juggle uni applications and like you're also, your courses will probably start to get a lot harder. Um, and so just having that first draft means you can just worry about editing it. Um, I think I showed my personal statement to a few people and like one person like completely rewrote it. Um, so yes, you can like take on like other people's points but at the end of the day it's still your personal statement and if you disagree with what they've said that's that's okay you don't have to change it just because your teacher said you have to um yeah that's a brilliant point about owning your personal statement I think Elizabeth can I stick with you just for a second because we've had a question um about uh, uh technical interviews and I think um your subject is the, the most technical I suppose, <laughs> of, of of the ones we have represented but I'll also I'll also come to Anna on it too because I think it it, it will be helpful to have a, a wider scientific perspective. What kinds of questions were you asked? What kinds of uh, things, what, how, did it, how did it work? Yep, so I was asked mostly technical questions. Um, so maths questions and physics questions. Um, I, was, I did a gap year um, and on my gap year, I worked in industry for 13 months, which is something I'd really recommend doing. Um, and you're welcome to ask more questions about that if you have any. Um, so they did ask some questions about that, um, but yeah, don't expect them to ask you questions on your personal statement because for engineering, they don't always. Um, a lot of the time they just do kind of go straight in with the maths and physics. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, Anna, did you have a similar experience in a, in a sciences interview? Sorry, I was trying to find the unmute <laughs> Uh, so I am currently doing chemistry, but I applied for biological natural sciences and I also didn't interview at Sydney. I interviewed at uh, Jesus College, actually. So I think my experience might be different, but um, I was weirdly given two biology interviews, which I know, now know is quite unusual for, for biological natural sciences. Normally, if you did chemistry, you'd be asked about chemistry as well. Um, but my interviews were, were very very um, like they were super friendly. Um, I didn't think there was a lot of um, ask like questions about my personal statement or my interests, but they definitely did, you know, make an attempt at first to have some small talk, make me uh, feel comfortable. Um, and I found that a lot of the questions were quite, um, allowed you to put in quite some creativity. They were quite abstract and broad, um, especially as biology questions. They didn't sort of ask about specific molecular pathways or um, organ function or whatever. It was all very um, more generalized. And I felt that even though maybe coming like from a different school system, my knowledge might be slightly different. That didn't affect me too much because the questions were so um, broad in general and they were also very progressive. So it was the type of thing where the question was so broad that your answer might not you know, be the most detailed. And then they'd ask you about specific parts of your answer within the question, um, obviously supporting you in that and um, giving you helpful tips and pointers along the way. Um, and then sort of leading you down maybe a more specific direction based on what knowledge you've acquired over your studies and um, perhaps your reading that you did for your personal statement as well so yeah that was kind of my experience and I, I think I was asked some maths um, but in a bio like a biological context um, I know from course mates of mine that they've been asked to like sketch graphs and stuff like that um, as well. Fantastic so the questioner was was particularly interested in technical and scientific subjects I think we should broaden this out to the arts and humanities world frankly because we're quite good too so um, should I come to you first Katie tell us a little bit about your interview. Yes, so I had 
quite an intense day for my interviews because um, classics you have um, at at interview assessments. So Catherine talked about the two types you have pre-interview or at interview. So I had three interviews and an exam all in one day, uh, which was quite a lot. Um, and uh, so for classics in particular, you do two interviews with the college you've chosen and one with a different college. It's just a quirk of classics. I don't know any other subjects that do it, but um, so I interviewed two with uh, Sydney and then one with St. John's. Um, I had one interview that was kind of based around literature more. Um, they picked out some quotes from my personal statement and asked me to kind of discuss it. Um, back up my point they gave me kind of new points of view to see if that kind of changed what I was thinking so it was all about kind of responding to stimulus and talking out loud then they gave me the most horrific passage of Latin I've ever seen I got like two lines into it and I thought that's absolutely it I'm out um, but you know they they want to see how you work you talk out loud you do your best and if you can't do it you can't do it you can't really change anything at that point at that point, I was like, I don't know if I should go to my next interview, but I did. It was really lovely. I had some pictures to talk about, some archaeology, um, some objects to kind of talk, and they linked that into my studies. And then the final um, one I did, uh, my third interview had um, a passage that I got 10, 15 minutes to look at beforehand. And then I could discuss that um, with my interviewers and they could kind of ask me bits and pieces about it, what I thought. Um, so I had quite a varied amount of things and then I also you know had the interview going uh, sorry the exam going on so that was just translating a passage of Latin as well so it was a very busy day and there were a lot of different kind of styles I think for classics because it's a very broad subject it's sort of a lot of things but just based on one time frame so there's philosophy like linguistics archaeology language so I did have like a lot of different things going on but I will say like I really enjoyed it um, and again, if there's like some bits of it that you weren't great at, but there were other bits where you, you know, did really well, like maybe I did a really bad job translating the Latin, but I did a good job discussing the archaeology or kind of looking at a passage and analysing it. They will take that into account. They're not just going to go, oh, you messed up one thing, you know, you're done for or anything. It's not that they look at everything holistically. So, yeah, it was <laughs> busy, but good. Lovely, thank you very much, Maria. What, tell us a little bit about your interview. Yeah, um, so I had two interviews uh, and they were both very sort of archaeology based. Um, so the first one, I got asked a lot about my work experience. So sort of like what I did in my excavations, what um, I learned from them, sort of if we discovered, sorry, if we had discovered anything very interesting, which sadly we had not. Um, but essentially it was very much focused upon what I learned and if I acquired any skills through them. So I talked a little bit about that. Um, and this must have been, I think, the easiest part of my interview because it was just relating my experiences. And then um, it sort of moved on in my first interview and the beginning of my second one um, to different scenarios. It was sort of like, it was very interesting, just detective work. So it was just very different, a lot of different situations about the past. And I was just sort of asked to think uh, and to analyze how I would go about solving them. So for example, I was asked how I would find burials of poor people and how in contrast I would find burials of um sort of rich people so it was kind of like um different questions like that and they were all building up on each other so it was just a scenario and it was going from one topic to the next but they were all very interconnected so it was more like a conversation rather than a test of oh how are you going to find these people um and then the last one and by far the most fun i was given two objects and i had to describe them um and i was also asked to date them in which i failed so <laughs> extremely bad um but the point I think of the exercise was sort of like to see how what my perception of objects was and which characteristics I would focus on and how I would try to just go about um understanding where they came from and what they would have used for so I was given for example an oil lamp and the other one was a brooch um a roman brooch that I just very very badly misstated afterwards um so my point is that even though even if you say something very very wrong especially if it's in a situation where you have to sort of use skills that you haven't fully developed yet um they just want to see if you think critically and that you sort of use the information that you have to solve the problem rather than see that you have very specific skills that you have haven't learned yet so all in all i had a very very good experience um so yeah Fantastic stuff. OK, so um, I have a question for you all about college choice. Um, and um, this is obviously a question that, that 
that we are asked to think about a lot. Um, I know not all of you chose Sydney actually, so that's a really helpful thing to be able to put into this conversation too. Um, but the question I would like to know, I think a little bit about what makes Sydney special, but also some general advice on, on what you looked for when you chose a college and, and if you have any advice on that. But before you do that, to give you some chance to think about it, I'm gonna quickly knock off some uh, uh, questions about the SAQ that have come up in the, in the chat. Um, so, uh, the person who has asked about the kinds of questions that are asked in the SAQ for engineering, the supplementary application question or SAQ is a generic form. So everybody gets asked the same questions and you are sent a link to it automatically when you submit your UCAS form. Um, so you don't need to worry about finding it, you'll be sent it automatically. And the deadline for submitting it is the 22nd of October, so the week after you have submitted your UCAS form. You can, of course, submit it sooner if you wish to do that, if you, if you have um, submitted your UCAS form early as well. Um, so the kinds of questions that are asked in the SAQ, alongside um, giving you the opportunity to add a supplementary personal statement if you want to, it is completely optional, we ask things like your uh, class sizes, at school, we want to know whether you've had any challenges in your teaching. Uh, we want to know um, whether there are uh, particular or what particular topics you're doing in your subjects at school, so we can contextualise anything that you say at interview. Um, it's that kind of general question that we, that we have, and we use that information just to supplement the stuff that you give us on your UCAS form and try and provide a. Um, consistent information across applicants who are applying to us from all different kinds of qualification systems around the world. So don't worry about the SAQ, it's not a test. Um, you, can, you can log in, you can log out, you can take, take several days to do it if you want to, um, but it's just a, a way for us to get a little bit more information about you. It's not subject specific, it's, it's everybody. So I think I've, uh, uh, Zoe's very helpfully put a, a, a link in the chat for you to follow up there if you want to. Just um, to Quick oh, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Engineering SAQs. I'm um, sorry, I should have mentioned this during the personal statement section. So this is very specific to engineering, but the Cambridge engineering course is general engineering for the first two years, and then you specialize in years three and four. So quite often you'll have applied for maybe mechanical engineering, or like in my case, I applied specifically to biomedical engineering courses. And the engineering, uh, like DOSs and like academics know that most places don't do general engineering. So your personal statement might be very tailored to that specific type of engineering. And then in your SAQ, um, you can write in the alternative personal statement that you can be like, I've applied to these specific engineering courses, um, but this is why I want to do general engineering at Cambridge. Um, and it just gives you some space to talk about like the other types of engineering. Um, yeah. Perfect, thank you. And um, Anna, you may want to make a similar comment for natural sciences, I imagine. Yeah, I think this depends hugely on the person and what courses mm. you apply to, because there is other natural sciences courses mm. in the UK, and I apply to a couple of them. Um, I think most people sort of apply to a mix, so because there's not that many courses, I, I think I applied to two natural science courses and two non-natural science courses, and both of those are also very different. I think one was biochemistry and the other one was maths and biology or something. But um, normally I don't, I, I personally didn't write the SAQ personal statement and I don't really know of that many people who have because if you're applying for natural sciences you're not although you will be doing probably one other science that you're not necessarily that isn't your main you know area of interest um that's you're not necessarily expected to have any previous knowledge or study especially if you're doing something like earth sciences where that's not a school subject so I think a lot of people just kind of write the personal statement for their main subject area that they think they might go into within natural sciences and then that should do the trick unless you're applying to very wildly different courses at other universities or you have something maybe you do have an intense interest in earth sciences along um, along with biology then of course you can write about that if you want to um, in the SAQ but don't worry about it if you don't like you don't need to be the perfect sort of all-around scientist who knows everything about everything so Fantastic. So we've got um, two really helpful and very different perspectives on them here. And I think that showcases how genuinely optional the SAQ is. If you can say something that you want to say, feel free to use it. If you don't have anything to say, you don't need to fill the box. It's absolutely fine. OK, lovely. Um, the, just to be absolutely clear, because there's a question that's come through, you must submit the SAQ. It is a part of the application process. You would submit it. You would, your application would not be valid without it. Um, so it is, it is not an optional uh, form. 
Okay, wonderful. So I'm going to come back to our panel um, and ask them uh, that question about college choice, that vexed question of college choice. Um, Maria, can I come to you first? Yes, um, so I did not to Sydney. Um, so I did an open application and then I got pulled in a long series of steps, but essentially the point is, um, I did an open application, so I'm an international student and I wasn't actually able to visit Cambridge that many times, so I just didn't think I had enough information um, about all the colleges to just make a choice. Um, and in all honesty, after two years, even if I did, I would have struggled very, very much because um, I think they all have a lot of positive points um, and a lot of sort of common, common grounds to compare them on. Um, so yes, I did an open application and I think people tend to be a little bit frightened of it, of an open application. But really, it is very, very useful, especially, you know, it's better to just do that instead of just pick a college at random, I would say, um, because you, it ends up in the end, every college, every Cambridge student loves the college they, they're a part of, they become very possessive of it, they become very soft, um, they love it a lot. Um, so Sydney specific, what is the best thing about Sydney? Um, I guess since I'm the first one, I'm going to take the Sainsbury's excuse so no one else can hold it afterwards. Um, so essentially, if you have a visit in Cambridge, Sydney is right opposite Sainsbury's, um, as in it's three seconds on foot away, which is very, very useful. Um, I don't think I have ever done a big shop in my life. I just sort of go five times a day and buy um, items uh, separately, which I know sounds very, very stupid, but it's just, it's just what it is. Um, and in general, I think um, Sydney's location is very, very, very good. It's in the centre of town. It's close to everything, apart from Sainsbury's. Um, there's restaurants, um, departments are all very close. Um, so they're either 10 to 15 minutes on foot or um, on a bike, um, whatever you want. And it's just very, very useful. You never have to um, sort of wake up very early. Um, you know, if you go somewhere and you forgot your phone, you can just walk back to college. Um, and I just find that very, very useful. Um, because I do not, I'm not very good at cycling um, and I don't like public transport. So that is just a very positive point for me. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, Katie, I'll come to you next. You took like everything. <laughs> <laughs> not just saying it's... Um, No, so I actually did apply to Sydney directly. Um, I tried to take a very methodical approach when I was looking at colleges. So I uh, wrote out a list. I had a list online of all the colleges and then I took out the ones that were that didn't apply to my age group. I took out the ones that were too big for me or too small for me, the ones that were too far out. Um, and then, you know, I had whatever criteria that I wanted. Um, and then I got down to a list of about 10, um, went to visit as many as I could, and then just really started arbitrarily kicking colleges off. I was like, I don't like your college colors, Never mind. Um, so I, it is like, if you apply and don't and it, you might get pulled and put to another college that's not a bad thing everyone always says it but you'll end up loving the college you're at um i was very biased towards sydney because at the open day they gave out free ice cream um and they were really friendly and so i mean i think that is a good indication that the college is really friendly and so i did kind of get that atmosphere um but yeah i also really liked the um the director of studies for my course at sydney um did kind of subjects that were quite similar um specialized in things that i found really interesting and i'd heard that he was really nice um so you know that kind of encouraged me to apply there but um yeah i mean i think of like the last sort of five ten colleges if i'd ended up in any of them i would have been really happy so um it's not you know the be all and end all you know different colleges have different advantages um some you know of course some disadvantages and things um but you know i i really love sydney so <laughs> lovely thank you katie elizabeth let me ask you next so i applied originally to jesus college um the first time around i applied because it was um yeah i guess fairly central um and I don't know, I just, it was big and like people at my school had heard of it. So I was like, okay, I'll apply there. And then the second time I applied, um, my friend had gotten into Sydney. And so I actually knew Sydney existed the second time around. And then I was like, wow, this is such a nice college. Um, so I think, yeah, a lot of it is just luck. Um, but yeah, I, what I'd recommend doing is make a list of priorities. Um, so for me, that was like the kitchens, um, the location of the college, like how far the like 
location of the college in terms of Sydney is very central, but also your department might not be very central. Um, so the engineering department's kind of south, yeah. Um, and the size of the college, you can also find out like how many roughly people in your course go to that college, at least you can for engineering. So Sydney, like this year, we've got 13 engineers and I thought that was kind of a good middle range because some colleges have eight, some colleges have like 30. Um, so I was like, okay, 13 sounds like a good number. Um, and we also have our own engineering society at Sydney. So just saying it's pretty great. Fabulous, thank you very much, Elizabeth. Anna. I also applied to Jesus um, and then got Sydney through a very long and complicated route, which I won't go into. But um, I, so I applied to Jesus because first of all, they had the exact same amount of students in a year as my school did. Um, weird decision on my part because I really didn't like my year in school. So I had no idea why um, I, that like sense of familiarity would be beneficial to me necessarily. But um, and also because they had a cafe, which would have been nice, I guess. Um, but I think that actually, because so Sydney is quite a small college, college relatively. I think there's probably a couple that are smaller, but it's it's definitely a lot smaller than Jesus. Um, and I think that suits me really, really well. I think the sort of community feeling at Sydney is really nice. Um, I, I think a couple other like pros of Sydney include um, the college bar, which is run by students. That's very um, unique within Cambridge. Most college bars are run by like adults and catering companies. Um, whereas the Sydney bar is very sort of, friendly and um, has really cheap drinks actually and the music's always what students want rather than what 20 some like 20 30 something adults want um which I always really appreciate and also it has a dartboard which is good and secondly I think the accommodation at Sydney is really nice actually um I think some of the central like old colleges have a lot of off-site accommodation because they just couldn't fit it into the old buildings anymore um, and Sydney has some off-site accommodation, but all within really, really close because we're slightly like we're slightly we're very much in the centre, but slightly on the edge of the centre, which means you're also not necessarily in the tourist hellhole. Um, so that's good. And also the accommodation, I think, is very well priced compared to um, other things I've heard. And there's quite a lot of kitchens available, especially in your second and third year, if you're looking out to get a kitchen, that's definitely possible. Fantastic. Um, we've got quite a few more questions to get through. I just want to sort of get through some of the, the um, admissions ones, but um, there are some that I'd like to sort of uh, you to think about um, and I'll come back to you in a moment. Um, coming back to interviews again, uh, people are really interested to know how you might show um, a passion for your subject, uh, both within your personal statement and an interview. Now, I have some thoughts on that, but I'd be very interested in, in what your thoughts are as well and, and whether those thoughts match. So, so I'll come to you again on that in a moment. But I just want to um, take off some of these first. Um, do you prefer three or four A-levels? Uh, three is absolutely fine. The majority of our applicants come to us with three. Um, so if you're taking three A-levels, absolutely fine. Um, if you're able to, if, if you're offering four, um, chances are you might be applying for a sciences subject and that may well be a, an A-level in a relevant subject. So let's imagine it's further maths. So if you are doing four A-levels, you, you may receive an offer that's based on four A-levels, particularly if those four A-levels are all relevant to the subject that you're applying for. So do bear that in mind, but there's no particular, there's no advantage to doing four A-levels over three and the majority of our applicants come to us with three A-levels. Um, and again, the, the person who has asked about um, predicted grades and whether three A stars is, is worse than four A stars, don't worry about that. Um, uh, three A, because we're looking at three A levels for the majority of our applicants, that would be absolutely fine. Um, so three A star prediction is a, a, a nice profile. So don't worry about, about missing a fourth. <laughs> it's it's not, not, not something to trouble about. Okay, so. Coming back to this idea then of showing passion for your course, um, how do you think you might go about it? Because it's, um, it's one of those things that, that I think people worry about being able to convey within the admissions process. Um, who haven't I asked first yet? Uh, Anna, shall I ask it to you first? Yeah, sure. I was, I think I was once told by someone that you had to like smile throughout your whole interview. And I don't know how the other people on this panel felt when they were interviewed, but I was not in a mood to be smiling, um, especially in my second interview, because I'd had a really, really like, well, it, it, for my experience, horrible interview. Um, 
so I wouldn't worry about that too much I think everyone will understand that you're stressed and very nervous and like it's a big busy day and you might not have slept as much as you would like to so like you don't you don't have to smile throughout your interview also that would be quite scary and robotic I think if you did um so I would say your passion throughout your subject can stand out through a couple of ways but if, if in your personal statement you're able to um not just mention what you've read but what you thought about it and how the different things you've read maybe link up to each other and link up to um, your course at university um and in interview I think a willingness to try if you don't know the answer can definitely show passion so I was asked a lot of questions I, at, where at first sight I would have been like I, I have no idea what what you're on about um but then being able to you know give some somewhat of a shot of it even if your shot might not be very good I think that's definitely worth doing um yeah I think showing passion for a humanity might might be more might be more easy than for a science subject um so I'm sure they the humanities have better ideas about this as well <laughs> that's some really good advice there Anna thank you that's a very good answer uh Katie I'll come to you next I think Yes, no, I agree with Anna with the smiling thing. I mean, I almost accidentally got invited into an economics interview um, instead of the, they were like in parallel rooms. So that would have been terrifying. Um, but yeah, so I think showing passion for me, I definitely agree. Drawing links between things is always really good. Um, I think I was a bit scared that because um, like with humanities, I was like, oh, I'm going to need to know everything about every single aspect of this course and, and that's not what you need at all. Um, I think knowing and being able to talk about a few areas, things you mentioned in your personal statement, um, I found really useful. So for me, I mentioned earlier, but like talking about Sappho and her sexuality, I found really interesting. I found a personal connection to it and I was asked about it, I think in all three of my interviews. Um, and so I found that like having that um just genuinely really enjoying your subject or certain elements of it is great and you're not going to be asked the questions that you haven't like I looked up a lot of interview questions because I thought oh you know that'll help I'll be able to prepare answers to them all and that is not something you can do at all it's just about kind of talking your thoughts out loud and if you do look up interview questions online please don't be scared by them because I saw some really terrifying ones that weren't at all linked to things I'd studied so I wasn't going to be asked them um, but I was really scared that I'd have to know like everything so I think being able and being comfortable to talk about your subject um, in an academic sense and also I would say um, if 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 you're wrong trying not to panic too much about that but listening to what is being said thinking out loud you're they're looking for potential they're not looking to trip you up um and so just trying to actually enjoy it in that you get to talk about things that you should you know be in you you ideally really like with some really interesting people who also like that uh which for someone who does classics which is quite a small subject I wasn't very used to so I found it really enjoyable um so I think yeah just try and make the most of it fantastic um Elizabeth I'm going to ask you a slightly different question because I'm conscious that I want to try and get through as many of these questions as, as we can so there's a specific question about what kinds of questions you might be asked in an engineering interview so I wonder if you could give us an example of maybe one question that you had um, and, and what it was. <laughs> okay. Um, if you so, can remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um, I'm not going to go into too much detail because yeah but I was basically asked about cans of paint and how to optimize how to like basically work out um the volume of the can of paint and how much metal would be used and um i had to draw a graph i had to do some differentiation some integration um so yeah i would say don't go too crazy with trying to learn really advanced things because you don't need to know that like they know that everyone is um or like majority of people are kind of year have only done year 12 content um they're not expecting you to know things from outside of like the specification of the admissions test um but they're just trying to see if you've like made the connections between what you're learning um and if it's okay i can post some links in the chat about for like helpful questions yeah so um if you if you want to recommend something like i want to study engineering.org yeah. or isaac physics they will be absolutely brilliant to post things to thank you <laughs> i haven't quite managed doing all of these things at once so <laughs> that's excellent 
Um, okay, brilliant. So I just want to answer a couple more uh, questions um, as we go through. Um, and they are uh, GCSEs that are not relevant to the course that you apply to, are they, are they still looked at in the application process? And the answer is both yes and no. We will be looking at your overall uh, academic performance to date, and we'll be looking that, uh, at that in, within the context in which you've achieved it. Um, there may be some subjects, particularly when you, if you're going on to um, specialise in a certain area of subjects at, at A-level, um, and they're different to the kinds of things that, that you did poorly in or less well in at GCSE, then we're more interested in the, the kind of trajectory that you're on. You know, are you doing really well in the qualifications that you're currently studying? Because we know that the best predictor of, of how well you do when you get here is actually the sort of things that you're really caring about and specialising in as uh, at A-level. Um, so if your GCSEs, you know, have a few wobbly patches, don't let that put you off making an application. Um, we'll obviously look at that. Um, and if there's a good, if there's a reason for it, we'd like, we'd like to know about it. But we, so the answer to that question is a kind of a yes and a no. We are interested in your academic record overall, but we're very much more interested in your current academic performance. Um, how do you submit a portfolio for architecture? Uh, this is the same as if you had to submit written work for an arts and humanities subject. Uh, the college that you've applied to will contact you after you've made your application and give you details about how you submit uh, work in advance. And they'll have particular requirements about what it is for any individual subject. Um, so for your architecture portfolio, if you can submit an electronic version of that, then we'll, we'll ask you to do that by a certain deadline. It's usually the first few days in November and we'll write to you in, in good time to enable you to do that. Um, what would happen if uh, your computer crashed during an online interview? Um, this happens, uh, we know it happens. Sometimes internet connections go wrong, sometimes, sometimes there are technical problems. Um, we have extensive training for our interviewers to how to deal with technical problems uh, during interviews. Um, and we take that into account as part of your performance. If we can kind of continue with the interview, uh, we'll, we'll do so at the time. But if for some reason the interview can't go ahead, I don't know if your computer fails completely or if your internet totally dies, um, we'll find another way of assessing you. We'll find a way of um, either uh, rescheduling that interview for later in the day or maybe rearranging it for a separate day if we, if we have to. But don't worry, um, we can deal with technical problems. And actually, uh, I understand that they were few and far between in the most recent um, admissions round, which is also online. Um, uh, I know that Elizabeth has very answered, answered a, uh, very helpfully this question about um, uh, gap years in, in the question and answer box. So thank you for doing that, Elizabeth. Um, just to add a, a sort of admissions perspective to that, uh, applying after you've got your results is absolutely fine. Applying before you have your results and intending to go on a gap year is absolutely fine. And also applying both times is absolutely fine. Um, so they are they are uh, all routes. Um, uh, can stand you in good stead. So, so don't, don't worry about your individual circumstances. In that case, we don't have a particular preference. Um, for subjects like engineering, I guess it's more common to do a, a gap year and do work experience on your gap year, but it's absolutely fine for any subject. So, so don't worry too much about it. Um, some questions that I would like to pose uh, um, about uh, admissions assessments. Now, obviously, admissions assessments have um, changed a little bit since since all of you went went through the admissions process. So, um, if 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 you say something that isn't right anymore, I'll I'll correct you. <laughs> um, but uh, can you say a little bit about how you prepared to take admissions assessments in your subject? Um, I'll go to a pre-interview subject first. So we have uh, engineering and natural sciences, both of which have pre-interview written assessments. Um, so, Elizabeth, would you like to tell us a little bit about the engineering admissions assessment and how you prepare? Yeah, um, so one really important thing that we sometimes get asked, like on the engineering open days, is um, don't use the MAT and the PAT, which are the Oxford Maths and Physics Engineering, uh, not engineering, Maths and Physics uh, entrance exam tests, um, because that style of question is really, really different to the one Cambridge uses. So a lot of teachers, like at my school, they didn't really know how to help Oxbridge applicants very much, but they were like, oh, well, we know some people like a while back, they did these. Um, so they gave those to me to, for me to do, um, and they were not helpful at all, don't use those. Um, just use the past papers that are on, I think I sent a link um, on the Cambridge website. Um, 
and just the engineering ones they're quite short questions you just need to get um do lots of practice in that and the style of question the style of exam has changed slightly over the years so you also need to be aware that past papers are not um they might not be in the same format as the test you'll sit so you just need to read what the website says basically that's the best place to look perfect thank you anna can you tell us a little bit about the natural sciences admissions assessment and how you prepared yeah so back in 2018 the natural sciences admission assessment was had two sections so one is like a sort of very fast paced multiple choice um section where you had to do maths i think and you do two other sciences if i remember correctly um and then the second part is two questions per science and i remember i think there was a maths there as well i'm not really sure anyway you that each science had two questions and you chose two in total so you could do two from the same science or two from different sciences um i think i did two chemistry but anyway um i remember when i did my admission assessment i figured well i remember i did i prepared for a little bit because i had a week of half term beforehand and i was coming from a different school system so i think that affects things quite majorly when it comes to um like sciences which are very like content based um, and so I, in this holiday, kind of read through the specification and that was, I'm very happy I did that because for me, at least I am um, um, from the Netherlands, I did Dutch, like Dutch school exams and the content was quite a bit different in some of the, some of the sub subjects. So there ended up being a lot I had to like sort of last moment look into um, and read up on, which is absolutely fine. Um, so if you're not coming from A-level might be worth looking at. I think if you are coming from A-level, the admissions assessments are meant to be designed to meet the content. So I think the section one is meant to be GCSE and section two is meant to be AS level. So if you're, you know, if you've done those qualifications, I wouldn't worry about that too much. Um, but yeah, I, I would say try and do a couple of past papers, see how it goes. If you do really horribly in them also like, don't worry too much. Um, I think most people find that assessment quite stressful um, and, you know, have a hard time doing it. I definitely did. Um, and also don't like, I it, I wouldn't prepare for it like you would for an A-level exam. Like it's a very different type of thing. Um, it's way more, it requires way less preparation. It's meant to already overlap with content you've like you would have covered in school. And it's not, um, it's not a, like as big of a deal as an A-level exam would, would be. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, uh, as you've both said, the, the website is a really good place to look uh, for current information about what the assessment looks like. And um, we know that it's possible that if there's been disruption to your schooling over the past uh, year and a half, you might not have covered all of the things that you um, would have done in a normal school year. So please do make sure that you check the specifications for those uh, assessments and, and try and um, if you do feel you need to bring yourself up to speed, try and try and do that. I just want to ask Maria for a perspective on Nazi humanities one just quickly um, and then we'll move on to some final questions. Yeah. Um, so for archaeology at least, you're, you're kind of advised to not prepare that much. Um, so essentially the archaeology assessment, or well, when I sat the assessment, um, you just got some texts um, from different archaeologists or authors um, about different topics um, on archaeology, it could be literally anything. So, for example, mine was about gift giving uh, in the Congo a couple of centuries ago. Obviously, you're not expected to have any knowledge about these topics at all. Um, what you do need to do is have some critical thinking and intuition, and the questions are just very generic, as in, do you agree with the text, or how would you go about solving that problem um, in comparison to what the author is saying? Um, so essentially, um, what I did was just go through the past papers. Um, the, there's not a lot of the website. There were like four, I think, at the time. Um, just try to sort of understand what kind of text uh, it will be, and then just read sort of like articles or what's documentaries, just to sort of see um, that sort of like specific method of thinking that archaeologists um, use when they analyze things. But yeah, I wouldn't. It's not really knowledge based. It's more like how you think critically and how you analyze texts, which you we would have done in school. Well, obvious practice. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so there's one last question that I'd like to pose to all of you, and it's a question that's been here for a while, and I've been saving it because it's such a lovely last question. Um, and it was, how was the application process personally for you? Now, I know that this touches upon quite a lot of stuff that we've already been talking through in this whole session. Um, so I wonder if you could give us you know, just a, a little bit of an insight into your either your overall feelings about it or um, a particular anecdote that stands out in your memory about it 
um, whether you felt it was overall a positive experience, what you learned from it, that kind of thing. Um, and while you're thinking about what you're going to say, I will quickly answer these final couple of questions. Um, if you take four A levels, would all the grades be considered or would you prioritise the three best? Um, we would look at all of your A level results. Um, if you're offering four, we'd certainly look at the full, uh, full range of results that you achieve. As I say, most offers are typically based on three. Most students come to us with three. If you're taking four, we may make you an offer based on four, particularly if all four of those are, are relevant to the subject that you've applied to. So we won't necessarily just prioritise the three that you've got higher results in, we'll look across the whole of, of your academic portfolio. Um, I think the thing to bear in mind with Cambridge applications is that they are individual and holistic. So we look at a lot of information all of the time. Um, so if, if I'm giving you an answer that says, well, sometimes this and sometimes this, and it's all important, that's because it is genuinely all important. We do look at all of these different kinds of things for individuals. So I hope that's helpful. Um, and one uh, final uh, sort of question about um, arrangements is that will applicants be able to visit colleges this summer for 2022 entry? So people who are thinking of applying this summer. Um, yes, there are some circumstances in which you will be able to visit colleges, but it's, it's obviously not going to be quite the same as, uh, as, as going to open days and things like that in the past. So individual colleges have individual things set up for the summer. In Sydney, we welcome visitors over the summer. We allow you to do a self-guided tour of the college um, and then you can book an appointment to speak to one of the admissions team after your visit. Um, but we won't be able to let you go in and see any accommodation or the internal spaces of the college, um, I'm afraid, over the summer. But you can look at uh, Sydney's virtual tour, which gives you lots of information about what our accommodation looks like. Um, so if you want to visit Sydney, uh, please email the admissions office to book that visit um, and we'd be happy to accommodate it if, if we can. Um, and then so finally, we're on our last question, uh, and it's about the personal, how was the application process for you? Um, and we can congratulate ourselves on having answered all of the questions in this session. Um, so I will come to Katie first, if I may. Um, yes, so the application process overall for me, so I'm someone who struggles a lot with um, anxiety, uh, various kind of mental health things. So I overthink things a lot and I, um, and I thought that the application process was going to be awful um, and it, it wasn't it wasn't which was really good I I said I think looking back I can see certain things that I know I didn't do well in or that kind of I regret doing I think I found my personal statement I think I probably put put too many things in and then you know struggled a bit at interview but some bits of my interview weren't perfect um but you know my grades were good and kind of overall it all worked out so absolutely as Catherine said it is a holistic thing just because one bit is not you, you didn't do good in one particular element does not mean that you are kind of written out um I I really enjoyed the interview bit I found it really fun um obviously the waiting bits were never fun um but I think it's all about kind of balancing it out and reminding yourself kind of that you love your subject and you know why you're doing this um so in the bits where it's hard kind of just trying to stay positive um and overall you know it's not kind of a very painful process everyone wants you to be doing well so it's really nice to have people who are just actively looking to support you and particularly for anyone with um, any disabilities or mental health stuff if you let college know they can really help so for interviews I had someone who would in, I knew exactly where they would meet me and they took me to every single different place um, and you know being able to give that information they really can help you out with that sort of thing so if you do have any additional needs please do let you know, wherever you're applying, no, because that really can help. I really will second that. That's excellent advice. We can only take into account what we know about, but if we know about it, we'll do our very, very best. Um, Elizabeth, can I come to you? Yeah, um, I mean, I found the application process quite stressful. I'm not going to lie about that. Um, I think one of the things that I'd heard was like, oh like your interview it's going to be really fun and you're going to enjoy it and then I came out of it and I was like that was not fun I did not enjoy it Cambridge must clearly be the wrong place for me but like that's not true um yeah it's an interview it's going to be stressful and you're going to be nervous and probably say things you didn't mean but um yeah I would just try after the interviews there's not really a lot that you can do anymore so just try to put it all 
out of your mind and focus on something else and, like just focus on your a levels and your studies um yeah that's really helpful thank you for sharing that Elizabeth mm -hmm. I think that's a very good thing to take away I was wearing my Fitbit um and my heart rate was so high that it told me I was doing cardio um so you know even though like I did enjoy certain bits of it I promise you like everyone's going to be nervous and you know that's okay brilliant thank you um Maria I'm on to you next um I think the application process for me was uh very stressful not sure if I thought at the same time um, I think the most important thing was realizing that it's absolutely fine to ask, um, ask the college, or send them an email if you don't understand something, you know, if there's a form and there's a question and you're like, I've, I have no idea, my school has no idea what that means, just email admissions or tutorial office um, or whatever one is responsible. And they were very, very helpful for me, they just sort of um, explained everything in very, very simple terms. Um, and just, yeah, I also had um, a bit of trouble with postage. So um, some of my staff was late and that's absolutely fine. Um, if there is a difficulty, the best thing you can do is just let people know um, as soon as possible so they are aware of whatever difficulty you're facing. Um, and yeah, after I had to sort of realize that, I just kept emailing them um, every second day. Um, so, they, <laughs> so they did everything for me. No, I'm joking. But yeah, <laughs> love emails. And that just made everything much less stressful because you, I actually had advice from um, the, uni, um, the uni itself and the college itself. So yeah, just don't be afraid to ask questions. Yes, definitely. Good point. Anna, would you like to close with your, your words of wisdom? <laughs> sure, yeah. I can second on the emailing, even before you apply, you know, if there's a specific question or something particular you're worried about. I think I emailed Catherine maybe a year or so before I applied. I got a very nice reply. Um, oh, good. So that was all good. <laughs> um, and yeah, I remember for me applying was a lot of um, fighting my school on things, sort of getting them to fill in forms for me, which they weren't, you know, super willing to do at, in, at the time. But um, I'm sure everyone's experience is different there. Um, and overall, I think I wish I would have stressed a lot less about so many aspects of my application. I think particularly with interviews and admission tests, your like your own judgment of your performance is going to be really, really bad because um, a lot of the process is being asked questions that will stretch you and like they won't in my experience if you just know the answer to a question straight off they're not gonna leave it at that and say oh yeah you know you did great you knew the answer they're gonna ask you further and ask you things until you don't know um so i think a lot of people feel their interviews went really bad when they didn't necessarily because just because you've been pushed doesn't mean you did badly it's all about you know how you handled being pushed and whether you were still able to sort of try and say something at least um so yeah, I think my assessment of my own performance was, was pretty bad throughout the process. I mean, um, otherwise I wouldn't have been here. Um, and yeah, I think it, it can definitely be really fun. It can also be quite stressful. I think it can also definitely be both at the same time. Um, my, I find my interviews really stressful, but I also found them really fun and I learned a lot from them, actually. I, it felt like almost I was being taught as well as being quizzed. Um, so yeah, I think it's, you know, it's a mixed bag of experiences and you can, embrace all of them at the same time. Brilliant. Um, that brings us to the end of this session. So thank you first and foremost to our terrific panel. Um, I really appreciate the, the honesty and authenticity and enthusiasm you have brought to this. So thank you very much indeed for your time this evening. Um, and thank you for all the terrific questions from our, pan from our uh, attendees too. Well, we've covered a really lot of ground. So we'll send you a link to remind you of all the things that happened um, to, uh, to the video that we eventually make on this and it will probably also pop up at the YouTube channel too. So thank you very much indeed and hope to see you and hear from you at some point soon. Thanks. Bye bye then. <laughs>